please give it up for Harry. Thank you, dude. Yo, um, strong start. Um, I am, well, I'll tell you what, I, without this, I'll just go ahead anyway. Today, uh, there is something special. I'm actually celebrating two things today. I'm going to steal one of these for definite. Um, this is my 100th ever talk. This is the 100th talk I've ever given. And what's interesting, thank you. Um, interestingly, Stefan was present at my first ever talk in, uh, in Warsaw um, seven years ago. The second thing I'm celebrating today is um, my company's sixth birthday. I've been working for myself for six whole years today. So uh, there's some Prosecco making its way around. So cheers, let's celebrate. Thank you for being here. 100 talks is crazy. What's actually interesting, um, my first ever talk I ever gave, somebody emailed me. I didn't want to do it. No one wants to speak, right? It's terrifying. Uh, a conference emailed me saying, hey, do you want to give a talk? And I was like, well, of course not. <laughs> Who does that? Who chooses to get on stage and say things in front of hundreds of people? Uh, that was seven years ago, and I said yes. I eventually said yes. But I did two talks, and they were terrifying. And I was like, no, never again. Do you know what? It went well, but I didn't enjoy it. I've got Mark in the front row here. <clears throat> Mark uh, runs a conference called Beyond Tellerand. He pestered me for literally months, months and months and months to give my third ever talk. And I was like, dude, no, leave me alone. I don't want to do it. And he was like, I believe in you. You can do it. So that was about six years ago. So it's nice to spend my 100th talk with Mark and Toby and Stefan and everyone in this room. So I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Um, now, I'll stop being self-indulgent, and I will actually deliver you a talk rather than just talking about myself. Um, while we're drinking, we're going to be learning about resource hints, more than you ever wanted to know about resource hints. And I promise you, it is more than you ever wanted to know. There's a lot in this talk. Um, we're going to deep dive into the weird and wonderful, some bugs, some sort of strange behaviors. But this talk is all about web performance, and we're going to be talking about resource hints. Show of hands, who has actually heard of resource hints? That's proportionally, that's the biggest number of hands I've seen. Um, not ever, I've seen lots of hands. I mean. <laughs> Um, who is using resource hints? Who is actually using them in production? That's fascinating. Most of you have heard of them, but you're like, well, I'm not using them. Ugh. Well, after this talk, I guarantee you will be using resource hints. Um, yeah, cheers, celebrate. This is a slightly shorter version of this talk. If you want to see the full version of this talk, um, the slides are online, they're available. This is trimmed down a little bit, uh, but the full version has some more examples and that kind of stuff in there. I will let you get a quick picture of this slide if you need to. I'm going to have my first sip of um, Prosecco. Right then. I'm Harry. I'm a consultant performance engineer, which is what I decided to start calling myself, uh, from the north of England. And it's my job to help clients. Typically, typically it's going to be fairly large clients, have faster websites, more resilient, more reliable, uh, more performant uh, online experiences. <clears throat> Each of the clients on this slide and each of the clients I work with, they've got different problems. Uh, they've all got problems. Different problems, different budgets, different timescales, different requirements. And everything we do together is very much tailored to what they need to solve. But what I wanted to do with this talk is pick one kind of common thread, one thing that any company, no matter the size, no matter the scale, uh, everyone could use immediately to help make websites faster. And that's what Resource Hint are there to do. If you see a slide that looks like this, it's going to be a, a sort of um, a pro tip or a short summary. Um, if you see a slide that looks like this, it's going to be a warning or a bug or a regression, something to be aware of. And if you see a slide like this, there's a little camera just above Toby's head. Uh, this is uh, going to be a code example that perhaps you might want to take a picture of, so you've got a reference to the syntax while I'm talking about the feature. So resource hints. What even are resource hints? Spec defines them as primitives that enable the developer to assist the user agent in the decision process of which origins it should connect to and which resources it should fetch and pre-process in order to improve page performance. My god, that is boring. <laughs> Basically, in human terms, these are just single lines of HTML that can dramatically improve the performance of your applications. It really is as simple as that. Single lines of declarative HTML that go in your head tags that can have a profound impact on web performance. It gives the browsers uh, hints at what might be happening next, what might be happening soon, uh, where a customer might visit next. 
And it is as simple as this, drop them in your head tags. You can catch the whole spec. Obviously, of course, you can catch the whole spec online. Uh, but the whole point of this talk is that you shouldn't need the spec. I've cherry-picked the most important bits, the most useful bits, uh, potentially the scariest bits, because there are some bugs and regressions. Uh, but if you want to read the full spec, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, the first kind of warning I'm going to give you is that these are hints. Clue is in the title. The browser does not have to do any of these. It does not have to honor these hints at all. Uh, they are suggestions that the browser could do something to speed up a page. But the browser will use its own, it will determine its own kind of uh, reasoning, use its own heuristics as to whether uh, it executes them or not. So definitely use them. They're kind of opportunistic upgrades, is what I would sort of refer to them as. Um, but don't rely on them. They're not guaranteed to work all the time. So the hints we're going to be looking at uh, DNS prefetch, pre connect, um, prefetch, preload, and pre render. The first two deal with the scenario in which your application or your website needs to visit a third party domain. Um, the th last three deal with uh, sort of individual files, and specifically the last one that deals with specific web pages. Um, actually, just I'm going to interrupt here. Is anybody without a drink? Because there's a few down at the front. Anyone need to put your hand up if you need a drink? Seems like everyone's good. Right, OK. Start at the beginning. DNS prefetch. I'm going to start with this one because it's probably the most boring. It's the most simplistic. It's probably the least effective. DNS prefetch, as the name suggests, will prefetch DNS. It will resolve the IP address of a domain um, ahead of time. This is useful when your application needs to visit a different domain, a different origin, but you don't necessarily know which file it will need, or it may need several files from that origin. And we're just going to drop DNS prefetch in your head tags. What we're doing here is pointing to a domain, telling the browser, hey, you're going to be visiting this soon, so please work out the IP address. And the support is pretty good. It's around 81%. Uh, what's interesting here, the most important thing for me, I guess, is that um, IE is green, which is rare. Um, so if you do have to support older browsers, uh, DNS prefetch is the one to use. Um, the example I would use for DNS prefetch, uh, this is an example straight from my own website. There's a YouTube embed in the middle of the page. Um, the parser isn't going to know it needs to go to YouTube until it reaches line 155 of the HTML. And at that point, it panics, like, oh my goodness, what even is a YouTube? It has to go and find that domain. So when we request an asset from a brand new origin, we have to go through several steps. And the, what, what DNS prefetch solves is this first process here, DNS lookup, turning a domain, a human-friendly domain, into a machine-friendly IP address. The amount of time we are saving here is very variable. When I did the research for this talk, it was quite interesting. Uh, common names answer in around 80 to 120 milliseconds. Uh, less common names can creep up to 200 to 300 milliseconds. But in sort of edge cases where it's a brand new domain or the domain isn't very well cached or it hasn't been visited by, um, ever by sort of um, someone on your network or your ISP, you have to go to a recursive resolver. And it says here that uh, the time could be anywhere between 1 and 10 seconds. So the target we're aiming for is anywhere between 80 and 10,000 milliseconds, which is kind of annoying. Uh, but generally, what you'll find is it's not that effective. Here is a screenshot of um, a friend of mine did a little project where using DNS prefetch saves a tiny, tiny amount of time. What we can see is that green is now divorced from the actual connection overhead. Uh, but we're not really saving much time at all here. Uh, DNS prefetch is implemented. The first bug, I guess, is uh, DNS prefetch is implemented as simply prefetch in IE9 because wouldn't be a cool new feature without some kind of mistake. Um, anybody have to support IE9? Oh, just like two sad-looking people there. <laughs> I, I, work, I do a lot of work for British government. I have to support IE8, right? That's why I look so stressed. I'm only 12, right? It's, IE8 did this to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have to support IE9, uh, DNS prefetch isn't going to get you very far. Anyway, let's move on. Pre-connect. This is where it gets more interesting, gets more useful. Pre-connect will resolve the IP address of a given domain, but it will also open a connection and make that connection secure if it needs be, if necessary. And again, it's if you, if you know the domain, but not necessarily the URL, or you need to visit several URLs, several files on that domain. Again, the syntax should be getting familiar by now. Rel equals pre-connect, and this, part, this time we're warming up a connection to Google Fonts. Browser support for this is 84%, so technically it has better support than DNS prefetch. The only problem is um, IE is completely red, doesn't, isn't supported at all. But again, for most people in this audience, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, this will step through and do the next two bits as well. It'll do a TCP handshake and TLS negotiation. And this screenshot here is directly from my favorite technical book ever written. Um, do take a picture of this slide. Uh, because that book is completely free. HPBN.co is a free book all about high-performance browser networking. 
and it's completely full of really fascinating things about web performance. Now, this is this scenario of uh, connecting in best case sort of scenario, connecting to a domain from London uh, that's an, uh, a server sorry, that is in New York. We're losing hundreds of milliseconds here. For this best case scenario, uh, we've lost 168 milliseconds just opening up a connection. 168 milliseconds doesn't sound like a lot, but a client of mine, Trainline, they found that if they could make their site just 300 milliseconds faster, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds a year. So we can find half of that just by adding a single line of HTML to your head tags, right? Um, a pro tip, I mentioned this in my workshop yesterday, never tell your clients what you've actually done for them, just tell them the results of what you did, right? Here's my invoice for one line of HTML in the head tags. Uh, my site, before I implemented pre-connect, all of the connections here were opened at the very last possible moment. What we're doing is waiting until the most inopportune time to actually find an IP address and open a connection to that origin. By adding a few lines of HTML to my head tags, you can divorce that cost entirely. Pay it up front and remove it from the actual loading phase of that, uh, that asset. If you do need to support older browsers, you can, you can manage that. You can do pre-connect with a DNS prefetch fallback. And the nicest, most terse way of achieving this is just by overloading the, the rel attribute. The rel attribute can have uh, several values, uh, and this will do both, um, well, it'll do pre-connect in browsers that support that, falling back to DNS prefetch. Uh, bad news is this just flat out does not work in Safari. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it is a bug, it's a temporary bug, but Safari don't have a particularly quick release cycle. Um, so there is a bug open for this to get it fixed. Um, but that syntactic sugar, that nice terse way of doing this, technically will not work in a WebKit browser. We just fall back to this. It's a little redundant, it's a little, little clunky, but if you want to support both uh, new and old browsers, double it up. You want to put your pre-connect first so that a good browser can deal with, deal with the pre-connect and then ignore the DNS prefetch. If you had them the other way around, Chrome would do a DNS prefetch and then it would also have to execute a preload, as, uh, sorry, a pre-connect as well. Be judicious with pre-connect. Don't go crazy. Don't put a million pre-connects in your head tags. And there are a few reasons why. Uh, what you want to do is only warm up frequent and significant origins. Uh, Google Fonts is a, an important third party. Google Analytics is probably in the middle, right? You probably want analytics. Uh, Facebook tracking pixels, we don't want them anyway, but if we are going to use them, don't bother warming up a Facebook third party domain. It's not, it's not important enough. Also, if you end up with like a, a 50 uh, pre-connect in your head tags, that's probably a good sort of code smell, a good sort of indicator that you've got too many third parties anyway. Um, something we tend to forget is that opening TCP connections has overhead on both the client and the server. Keeping a connection to a server open is going to take CPU cycles, and it will drain battery. So don't open TCP connections that you don't need to use. And finally, um, there's a really weird, really, really weird bug in Chrome. It's so weird that I can't even believe it's true. And I, these talks are getting recorded, so I don't want to badmouth Chrome. Uh, if you catch me afterwards and ask me, I will tell you why. Chrome can only open six DNS connections. Oh, sorry, it can only conduct six DNS resolutions at a time. Nothing to do with H1's six TCP connections, nothing to do with that. There is just this bizarre, weird, you cannot believe it's true story. <laughs> Chrome is completely fudged, right? It just doesn't work um, in terms of DNS resolution. <clears throat> ask me afterwards privately, and I'll tell you what's going on. More bad news. Um, for some reason, this feature just disappeared in Firefox. Uh, Firefox 66, pre-connect just stopped working. Uh, it is a bug, it is temporary, it will be coming back, but for some reason, pre-connect stopped working in Firefox 66. Simple regression, uh, it should be on its way back in. Prefetch. So whereas the first two examples dealt with visiting third-party domains, <clears throat> the next ones deal with the specific files. Prefetch is a really interesting one. Prefetch is when we download a file needed for subsequent navigation. I think that spec writers would make really good lawyers because they're always very vague about how they word things. Um, what this could say is a file that's needed for the next page. But they use the word subsequent instead of next and navigation instead of page. This means that the feature has to work in single page apps. We don't have pages, we have routes or navigations. That's why we use the word navigation and not page. And the reason we don't use next is because it doesn't have to be the next view. It doesn't have to be the next route. It doesn't have to be the next page. It could be any subsequent page. So if you think you know where a customer is likely to head, if you've got a very predictable user journey, maybe it's a checkout flow, from page A, you can download the resources for page B ahead of time so that by the time they arrive on page B, the files have already been downloaded. Syntax should be getting really familiar by now, um, but the only difference here is we're pointing to a specific file and not just a domain. Pointing to videoplayer.js. I'll come back to this in a second. 
Support is pretty good, 82%. Uh, so definitely start looking at ways to use this. And the example, like the, my go-to example of a prefetch would be, let's imagine we work for YouTube, right? Pretty cool job, that would be nice. And we're building these search results page. Somebody search for, I don't know, cute cat videos. We are 95% certain that they're going to click on one of those thumbnails. They're going to go and watch a video soon. At that point, when they click through to that page, the page will start requesting the video player JavaScript, right? What we might as well do is, from the search results page, actually download the video player JavaScript ahead of time. We might as well preempt their next navigation and start loading files preemptively. It means that by the time they arrive on the page they're wanting to view, the assets are already in browser cache. Because that's exactly what Prefetch does. It simply downloads a file. It's not allowed to execute it. It downloads a file and drops it in browser cache, ready to be picked up later on so you can retrieve, <coughs> excuse me, retrieve uh, assets from the cache rather than the network. The spec even says the user agent should not apply preprocessing. It must not automatically execute the asset. Right? It must not run the thing that downloads. It's a very, very safe thing to use. It's just an, an inert downloader. It's downloaded by the prefetch, and it is run by however you invoke the script a script tag or a module loader, whatever it is, uh, that is when the script will execute. So basically, prefetch, you should think of as a preemptive cache. It will drop files into browser cache based on what their caching headers uh, dictate. One thing I found quite interesting is that, obviously, if you've told the file that it cannot be cached, you've got a no-store header, it will not store the file. If you have something like a must revalidate or a max age zero, the file will get revalidated before it is released from cache. And then the weird bit is, if the file gets more than five minutes old, it will get revalidated. I don't know who picked five minutes and why, but that's the way of things. So don't download a file that you think might not be used within five minutes. Um, in fact, no, if you've got a file that might not be used within five minutes, you need to speed your site up. Um, but yeah, um, weirdly, if a file gets more than five minutes old, it will get revalidated. So be careful with what you're downloading uh, so you're not wasting anything. The browser is very really smart about things. It will download all of these files with the lowest possible priority. So it will not interrupt the current page's performance in order to execute a prefetch. Um, and a weird thing I was sort of wondering is, what happens if I start prefetching a file from page A, and I navigate away from page A before the file finishes downloading? Will the browser continue the prefetch uh, download in the background? Uh, will it terminate it? Will it pause it and resume it? Uh, what's going to happen? It's very, very, very difficult to work the answer to this question out. But um, if you view Chrome's net log and see what the network is doing, it turns out that if you download a file on page A and navigate away from page A before the file is finished, the browser will continue downloading it in the background. No wasted downloads, no double downloads, and no termination. That's pretty nice. Back to IE9, uh, prefetch acts prefetch act like DNS prefetch in IE9 because for some reason they picked the exact opposite name. You couldn't make this stuff up. It's ridiculous. I've been a developer for 12 years now, and this stuff never surprises me anymore. It's like, of course, of course. It's bound to happen. If you're trying to do a prefetch in IE9, unfortunately, what's going to happen is it will just do a DNS prefetch. It will just look up the IP address for the domain you've supplied. Right then, preload. Now, I kind of lied to you a little bit, not on purpose, um, but there's a bit of a gray area around preload. Preload is one that the browser must do. So I said earlier that these are hints, and the browser will choose if it can do them. Um, preload was changed a little bit, and it was actually pulled out of the resource hint specification uh, because it is now uh, considered mandatory. So there is a separate specification for preload. Uh, the browser has to conduct this. It's defined as a mandatory fetch for a file needed for current navigation. Again, it's very kind of lawyer speak. This basically just means go and grab a file that is needed for this page, but wouldn't normally be discovered until quite late. So late discovered resources. It's a good way to surface late discovered resources to the browser. And I'll come back to the definition of late discovered resource in a second. <clears throat> Where preload gets a little different is uh, we have a bunch of new attributes that we can use. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional, but preload does start to look different because we augment it with different information. Um, we'll look at each of these in, in detail and what they do, um, but there's kind of a bit of, a bit of change happened where some of these that weren't mandatory now are. So a lot of um, my clients are actually having to refactor or go back and revisit these and fix them. Uh, browser support for this is 79% at the time I sort of looked it up. So it's enough to definitely start using it. Uh, but I do, in a few slides time, have some bad news for you. Uh, I'm actually, I won't, no, I won't give any spoilers. You can just look forward to some bad news. So what even is a late discovered resource? A late discovered resource is a file that the browser wouldn't normally discover until quite late. It's needed, it's necessary, it needs to find the resource, 
but for some reason it's hidden. Um, JavaScript applications, fully client-rendered JavaScript applications, basically every file in that app is going to be a late discovered resource. It isn't in the HTML payload, it's somewhere inside a JavaScript app that needs to boot and run. But also normal, regular sort of server-rendered sites, they're full of late discovered resources. A font, for example, you've got to download your HTML, your HTML then downloads your CSS, and then your CSS downloads a font. The font is what we would, we would call a late discovered resource. Same with background images. A background image in CSS doesn't get downloaded until the page is ready to be painted. So it's a late discovered resource. And like I said, a very traditional sort of just out of the box, I dare I say somewhat naive implementation of a JavaScript application, you have very, very late discovered resources. Your HTML downloads some JavaScript, which then boots and builds the virtual DOM, which then references a CSS file, which might then request a font. So you can see the time for discovering these assets is going up and up and up uh, the more kind of deeply we bury it. But Preload helps us fix this. Preload will help us, will help the browser discover these resources much, much sooner. For the JavaScript application example, you'll have your script for app.js. Uh, then you can preload your style sheet, so you can make sure the style sheet is downloading in parallel, and you can make sure your font is downloading in parallel to those as well. So now we've gone from that quite drawn out process to something as short as this, complete parallelization. The browser doesn't know that it needs the style sheet yet. The browser doesn't know that it needs the font yet. We just hold it to download it. When the app is booted, it'll be like, oh, sweet, I've already got the style sheet, I've already got the font, I don't need to go back to the network for those. So the as attribute. The as attribute is a little bit annoying um, because it was never intended to be mandatory. It was an optional extra that you could give that would assist the browser. Unfortunately, it was made mandatory recently, so if you've implemented preload maybe in the last couple of years, you might need to go back and add this in because with this missing, preload will break. So it's not very backwards compatible. But the as attribute just tells the browser what type of file it's about to request. Um, this is a preset list of types, audio, fetch, track, video, whatever. Uh, this is a preset list. These are all defined in the specification. And what the as attribute does is it helps the browser set the correct request headers. For example, um, you wouldn't pass an accept encoding header for a JPEG because you can't encode a JPEG anyway. Uh, you wouldn't say accept WebP. Uh, if it's going to be uh, downloading a style sheet, right? So it tells the browser what request headers to set. It helps with prioritizing the responses, and it also uh, helps with CSP. Well, you can't request that kind of file anyway, so I'm not going to bother. Um, here we can see prioritization in action. Preload has determined that a style sheet is the most important, uh, an image is the least important. But don't try and be sneaky. I can guarantee you that already at least one or two of you in the room have thought, well, I'm a hacker, I can get around this. Um, if this is the sort of syntax we're supposed to use, uh, it could be tempting to think, well, how about I try downloading my style sheet as an image, but my app as a style sheet, right? Uh, this will just break. This used to work, but now it will completely just error. It will actually double up the amount of downloads, making things much, much worse. What will happen is it will request your style sheet as an image with all the wrong request headers. All of a sudden, it can't be used properly, so it has to then dispatch the requests again. It's going to double up your downloads. However, the good news is, because people tried to be sneaky and get around this, there's a brand new specification on the horizon. It's not really usable yet. It's, it's only behind a flag in Chrome. Um, but priority hints. This is really exciting, for, for me at least, because I'm kind of a bit of a nerd. It's an exciting new specification where we can intervene. And we can do things like the masthead is important. Um, the logo, uh, sorry, lazy.css is low. So we can actually use the importance attribute to nudge these things around. Next, we have the type attribute, and the type attribute is optional. The type attribute is useful in cases where there might be some contention between the browser's support for preload, but its lack of support for a certain file. Uh, basically, I'm looking at Safari here. Safari supports preload, but it doesn't support WebP. So by passing in the type attribute, it means that Safari will not even bother processing this preload. It knows that it's pointless. Um, next, we've got the cross-origin attribute, and this is well, it's a silly thing to say. It's mandatory if you need it, but it's not if you don't. Um, <laughs> I've never found a better way of explaining it than that. Um, does anybody know much about cores and cross-origin? Right, well, that's a lot of people a lot cleverer than me. Um, every time I try and read cross-origin cores kind of stuff, I'm just like, I can never work it out. So my advice to you, if you're like me, is just keep an eye on console. Console will tell you if you've got it wrong. Um, Chrome is very, very helpful to you. Uh, so if you implement preloading correctly, you'll get lots of hints. Um, so I built the worst possible page preload thing, uh, and I got everything wrong. 
Uh, it told me that I didn't have a valid as attribute. Uh, one here was downloaded but not used. This is useful. A lot of people preload things they don't need, and it can waste bandwidth. Um, when you look at how the network actually behaves, uh, files are always fighting each other for bandwidth. So don't give bandwidth to files that you don't need. And finally, I got the cross-origin attribute wrong on a certain file. Chrome warned me, told me what to fix. Right, here's the, here's the bad news. Uh, Chrome is completely broken. Chrome just, and it's actually, I mean, I'm going to try and sound serious for a moment, but it's, it's really broken. It's bad. Um, it's broken enough that a lot of my work in the last year or so has been to remove preload from client websites, because preload is making websites slower, which is literally the exact opposite of the reason it was invented. Chrome's got some weird issues. Uh, they're not secret, they're not private. It's not like an expose. I just don't have time to go into them. If you're interested in learning about the issues, come and find me. I'll tell you. But Chrome over-prioritizes preload. So here, my friend Andy Davies again, he developed like, a test page to, to show what was going wrong. Here we've got a load of CSS, and I just want you to take a look at the numbers. Uh, 358 milliseconds. On average, the CSS has taken 375 milliseconds, right? Now, what you can't see is just sort of just above this chair, there's some web fonts being requested. So we thought, well, let's preload them so that the web fonts arrive sooner, right? So that we can render the text quicker. So we implemented preload. That's pathetic. If I walk further than a meter away, it doesn't work. Um, implement preload. And the expected behavior is, yeah, the fonts got downloaded sooner. But the problem is they stole bandwidth. They, to they stole bandwidth from the style sheet. Now the style sheets are taking, on average, 750 milliseconds, higher probably, more than twice as slow now. Um, the fonts arrive before the CSS, which is the exact worst way around to have things. A web font is useless if there is no CSS to apply it to the page. So preload here is making this site slower to the tune of about 400 milliseconds. 400 milliseconds slower to start render. So train line, 300 milliseconds was worth 8 mil to them. If I'd have implemented preload and made it 400 milliseconds slower, I would probably owe them more than 8 million pounds. How terrifying is that? So actually, unfortunately, I've been ripping a load of preload out of client websites because in Chrome, which is by far and away the most popular browser in the world, it's just useless. So beware Google Chrome. Uh, the fix is coming up, by the way. It narrowly missed getting into 70, uh, I think 70, but in Chrome 80, which is a long way away, but um, oh no, it shouldn't be now, but Chrome 80 is queued up. It's going to be released. Um, so when it's going to be like another year, I guess, until there's enough proliferation. But the fix is upcoming. Uh, it missed its release schedule. It's coming soon. But yeah, for now, not really that useful. Oh, last one, I promise. Pre-render is where it gets really interesting. Um, previously, we've looked at individual files. Pre-render is a mechanism uh, by which we can download and build entire web pages. And that is just not working at all. Download, actually, I've had this exact same clicker since my first ever talk. Um, I've never changed the batteries once, so I guess it's kind of fitting that it dies <laughs> on my 100th talk. Um, RIP little clicker. Um, download and build entire web pages in the background. What we can do is, if a customer is on page A, we don't just download the files for page B, we could say, go and get all of page B, render it in a hidden tab. By the time the user clicks through, the page is already built, instantaneous, uh, sort of. <laughs> uh, not quite how it works. Pre-render's had a very interesting and storied background. The syntax was dead simple. Link run equals pre-render, no extra attributes, and href points to a web page. Support is um, pretty dismal. Well, 71% in terms of actual users that can support it, but in terms of browsers, most of them don't. What I find quite telling, what you'll see is that it was present in IE 11, but it was such a bad idea, it never got ported across to Edge. They were like, no, leave it there, get rid of it. Um, but the use case would be, go back to the YouTube example, rather than just pre-loading, or sorry, pre-fetching the video player JS, uh, what you probably can't see, um, my apologies, really sort of faintly grayed out here is, you can load the actual video player page, right? Load the entire page, start downloading the video ready to be used. Uh, so is the theory, they killed it. Um, the reason they killed pre-render is actually really obvious when you think about it. If you tell a developer they can pre-render entire pages in the background, they're going to pre-render an entire website. <laughs> you know when you have to restart Chrome, and you've got like 50 Stack Overflow tabs open, and your Chrome takes so long to reopen all these tabs that um, you go and make a coffee, right, and just leave, it to leave your fans whizzing? Doing that 
sneakily on a user's device is not very really kind, right? It's not a nice thing to do. So pre-rendering lots of pages in the background means that every time they visit one page, they're potentially loading four, five, six pages. This then increases bandwidth costs for both you as the host of the site, the owner of the site, but also for the pe pe uh, people visiting it. If you've got someone on, um, so for example, um, when you use like airplane Wi-Fi or hotel Wi-Fi, sometimes it gives you a, like a megabyte allowance. You've got 90 megabytes of free sort of internet left. If you're loading four pages for every one page, what's going to happen is you're going to rinse through people's allowance. Um, it actually renders the page. So all of a sudden, clients of mine would implement pre-render and notice that, oh my god, we've got way more traffic this month. No, it's just it ran pre-render and you've got visits in the background. <laughs> but however, if you're running ads, right, four times as many ad impressions, <laughs> no, no. The most terrifying one, though, is um, security. What happens if uh, somebody's visiting an insecure website? Uh, it could be like a local restaurant, like a, an innocent kind of website. They get man in the middle. And somebody puts a malicious pre-render in the page. And in the background, in a background tab, that site could be loading a crypto mining web page, right? So this is the kind of stuff that we need to be aware of. So pre-render is dead, right? They killed it. Kind of. They brought it back. Um, they brought it back as something else called no state prefetch, which is annoying because all of them are called like these cool, like short names, like pre-render, prefetch. No state prefetch doesn't have quite the same ring to it. But what they did is they did something pretty clever, in my opinion. Uh, pre-render is the API. That's the word that we use. We call it pre-render still. We use that in our markup. But the mechanism under the hood is called no state prefetch. The important thing to remember here is pre-render will not render anything, right? which makes complete sense. <laughs> no state prefetch. I, I can see I'm, getting, I'm about to get like, pulled off stage soon. I promise you, I'm nearly there. Um, no state prefetch. Think of it as a recursive prefetch. Um, basically, the page you were going, a pre, going to pre-render becomes almost like, imagine, a package.json, right? It's an entry point. It's a recursive prefetch. So traditionally, what should have happened is you, you pre-render page B, and it gets built in the background. Now what happens is the browser will go and download page B, and it will download all of page B's sub-resources. It's like a recursive prefetch. So what you're doing is saying, don't render page B, don't run any of the code on page B, don't do anything like that, but just go and download the files contained within. Um, and he can see it in action. I've got a little dev sort of sandbox website, and what I'm doing is I'm just pre-rendering my, my personal site homepage. Um, and they're all fetched with the lowest possible priority. So what you can see here is the, the page that I built, the demo page, entry number one. Uh, it loads the load event fires, the vertical blue line. Then on entry three, the browser then goes off and downloads the homepage home page and all the files contained within it. It's like a recursive prefetch. OK, right, that was a whistle-stop tour of all things resource hints. Um, so just a quick summary. These things are quick, easy, cheap to implement. Uh, so experiment with them, right? Go mad. Um, you can get really forensic. Audit your current sites. Look at uh, user journeys. Look at common user journeys. Uh, get really creative. Get really sort of detailed and fine-grained. Um, there are other things like you can generate these things with JavaScript. So what you could do is you could say, if someone's cursor moves within, I don't know, 100 pixels of the Add to Cart button, you can generate a prefetch to put it in the head tag and you can start prefetching checkout.js, right? You can generate this with JavaScript, so you can get really creative. Um, but yeah, um, I think they're a really powerful, very simple specification, declarative, access to the HTML is all you need. So go for it, use them. And thank you very much for your patience, thank you for your time, and thank you for celebrating with me. Thank you very much, Harry. Mm -hmm.